I am pleased to be discussing with you all today the topic of uh, soot-free buses and their deployment in the bus rapid transit systems. The ICCT has been involved in the, the work of soot-free urban bus fleets for uh, the past two years under, uh, as part of a, a project implemented jointly by UN Environment and uh, and other partners, including the Centro Mario Molina Chile and the C40 Cities Group, uh, under the sponsorship of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. Uh, we have come across through our work uh, a number of opportunities to engage directly on the, the, the issue in bus rapid transit applications. And today, what I wanted to do was discuss just the overall context for this work on such free urban bus fleets and provide to those of you who are involved in work directly on BRT systems, just a sense of the, the kinds of results that we've had, the kinds of objectives we've been seeking, and the ways in which you might be able to carry forward the topic of soot free uh, within BRT systems, and especially where BRT projects you're involved in are undertaking new procurements. So I wanted to focus on uh, technology, on finance, on availability, and on climate impacts and benefits. So those are all the topics that I'm going to cover today. It's, there's been an impressive growth in the scale of bus rapid transit globally. Uh, just one data point that, that I came across was uh, this map produced by folks at Embark with IEA and, um, and, and others, uh, illustrating how in the most recent year, there were something like 32 million passengers per, per day globally riding on bus rapid transit systems in 165 cities. Uh, and the, the predominant sort of volume uh, of those BRT systems uh, is in places like China and Brazil, but but as you can see, BRT systems are really all over the world. So when we in our work are thinking about how to clean up bus systems, regardless of whether they're BRT or feeder systems, uh, it's impressive to see this, this sheer scale and penetration of BRT around the world. I wanted to just share a little anecdote uh, based on some work that we've done in Jakarta, uh, a team uh, traveled with, with me and uh, to Trans Jakarta, one of the, the oldest and, and largest bus rapid transit systems in place today, uh, to advise and support on uh, this question of how to clean up their bus fleet, and especially as they expand with plans to double growth quite rapidly over the coming years. Um, you know, Jakarta is a city that is suffering high and increasingly higher levels of pollution. Uh, the Trans Jakarta fleet is using gas, which is quite a clean burning fuel. In fact, one that we consider to be soot free, but with the potential and, and, and actually the reality that they are shifting some of those same buses to diesel, a diesel Euro 3. Nonetheless, in a place like Jakarta, where diesel fuel can have upwards of 3,500 parts per million sulfur, uh, according to national laws, uh, Jakarta has uh, procured uh, Euro 6 engines uh, beginning in August of 2015, uh, taking the final deliveries in May of 2016. So they are an example of uh, Euro 6 being the soot-free option that they are procuring. Now, this is a gas Euro 6 still, so this is not a diesel Euro 6. But uh, in fact, a gas Euro 6 is really uh, minimal incremental cost compared to, let's say, a, a gas Euro 5 or even um, an older technology gas engine. The fact is that in a place like Jakarta with uh, really an excellent uh, Trans Jakarta bus rapid transit system and fairly poor quality diesel fuel um, that we can see clean, modern bus technology uh, and it works. And so I wanted to kind of start with that example uh, and perhaps that inspiration as well to those of you who may be in places where you think it's simply not 
not possible. Um, one of the things that motivates us in all of this work, obviously, is, is air pollution. Uh, and, and some of you may have followed the latest headlines coming out of the journal Lancet, which uh, formed uh, uh, what they referred to as their Commission on Pollution and Health uh, and issued a report finding that, uh, you know, if you were looking at the headlines, pollution is killing more people than war and violence. Uh, I think quite a, quite a dramatic uh, and eye-catching statement. Interesting to me was the fact that out of the 9 million deaths that pollution from all causes uh, is generating, about half of those are, are attributable to outdoor air pollution alone. So when we think about the, the global impacts of pollution and the sheer volume of, of, of mortality that, that generates uh, that air pollution is a significant contributor and the largest contributor to that. And when we think about the transport sector, we know that um, the biggest and most important cause of pollution generated in the transport sector is the diesel engine. And, and, and I don't want to do just a blanket uh, characterization here of diesel engines because we do believe that there are clean diesel engines. Um, but the, the, the vast majority of, uh, let's say, older diesel engines are, are the ones that are contributing the most to the emissions uh, in, in the transport sector. And in response to that, of course, there are the health impacts. Um, and uh, we, we understand, for example, that based on decades of research conducted by by um, a number of scientists internationally, diesel engines have a carcinogenic effect, a toxic effect. The World Health Organization found about five years ago that diesel exhaust causes cancer, which is to say that there really is no safe level of exposure to diesel exhaust. Uh, and so the motivation to avoid lung cancer should include elimination of exposure to diesel exhaust. Um, we know that more than 80% of buses today that are that are sold are using diesel engines, uh, and I have some data that'll show how much of that is is is, is soot free. But but more so, we know that buses are are a big factor in the emissions of the transport sector writ large, and we unfortunately don't have more recent numbers or are in the process of generating them for for 2015. But at least for, for numbers we generated back in 2010, we found that buses are 28% of the, the PM 2.5 emissions generated within the, tra the on-road transport sector. And the main reason is that most of those are diesel engines and older technology diesel engines. So uh, despite the fact that buses may account for something like 1% or even less of the number of vehicles on the roads today, they are producing a quite a outsized share of the PM emissions uh, that are generated in the transport sector. And this is an issue because, um, of course, many of us who are working on climate issues, we, we see investment in public transit and in buses in particular as a key strategy to deliver low carbon sustainable urban transport. But I think our worry is that insofar as we make those investments with groups like uh, the International Association of Public Transport Authorities aiming, for example, to double the share of, of, of travel on public transit modes by 2025, those kinds of investments must be sensitive to the technology that's being used on the buses. And while um, uh, air pollution is, is one worry, uh, climate is actually another worry because there can be cli some climate disbenefits. And I just wanted to focus here on black carbon specifically. For those of you who, who have not been following the climate science, black carbon is a product of incomplete combustion. It's an ultra fine particle that is, you can consider it a form of fine particulates, a form of PM 2.5. In fact, black carbon is perhaps better characterized as PM 0 0.1. Uh, it is the material that makes the diesel soot appear black in color. And it's that black color that causes a high degree of atmospheric warming with uh, direct heating of the atmosphere. Uh, these maps illustrate some of that. 
as well as uh, heating and melting of ice and snow insofar as the blackness of those black particles is actually changing the, the reflectivity of bright surfaces and leading to the increased absorption of, of solar energy and the, and the accelerated melting of that. Uh, and as, uh, as a consequence of that, uh, those emissions of black carbon, there are um, significant climate impacts, but also benefits to the extent that we can control those black carbon emissions. Uh, one, one estimate comes from the Climate and Clean Air Coalition is that we could avoid by 2050 uh, half a degree of warming if we did combined controls of black carbon and methane. In this example, uh, I believe they were looking at something like a 75% reduction of black carbon and a 25% reduction in methane emissions. That would give us that 0.5 degrees avoided warming. Uh, and these are incredibly important reductions because we have a global target now of two degrees. Some might even say it's one and a half degrees now because that's also been inscribed in the latest COP Accords from Paris. But if we don't tackle these short-lived climate pollutants, and just to include in that basket the HFCs, if we don't tackle these short-lived climate pollutants, we run the risk of simply not being able to meet that two degree target. Um, and we can debate all day whether or not uh, we, we, can, we can ever meet the two degree, degree target. But let's just say that the odds are much greater of, of meeting that target if we tackle these pollutants, which we honestly should be tackling anyway because of their health impacts. Uh, and so, I think there is a positive message here, which is that uh, at least when it comes to diesel engines and when it comes to buses specifically, the solutions exist already. And just to illustrate the example that comes from some uh, filter testing that, that has been done here in California, uh, when diesel engines are tested with, a with an array of different technologies going from an uncontrolled diesel engine to one that has a diesel particulate filter, we go basically from white to black, uh, or I'm sorry, from black to white, uh, which illustrates how effective uh, certain controls can be. And, 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 and sort of to put a finer point on it, we have a wide number of control options. Uh, and, and when it comes to the diesel engine specifically, it's clear to us that there are technologies like the diesel particulate filter that uh, can basically eliminate the black carbon, that can basically eliminate the fine particulates, that can give us soot-free diesel engines. Now, I'm going to talk about other kinds of technologies that we also consider to be soot-free, but uh, in all of this, the main issue is how we clean up diesel engines that are on the roads today and how we ensure that future bus engines, whether they be diesel or otherwise, are the cleanest that they can be to avoid those pollution and health impacts. How do we get this technology on buses? Well, we take a policy and performance perspective. Uh, we know that there are various stages of emissions control for those countries that follow the European pathway and that it's only until you get to the Euro 6 level that you can get essentially soot-free emissions. And the main reason for that is that it's the Euro 6 emissions level that requires the, the use of technologies like the diesel particulate filter, since no other technology, since no other emission standard really requires that in, in buses. And with that, we get something like a 99% or greater reduction in the black carbon emissions. And so any, any other emission standard that buses are being designed to simply are not soot free and, and we, we cannot categorize those as such. Um, combined, of course, with that emissions performance is the very important and necessary enabling fuel. So for at least a diesel engine, it means having available 10 parts per million sulfur diesel fuel. Let me just touch on the other technologies uh, and, and really the broader point of how we're defining soot-free here. So as I just illustrated, uh, any Euro 6 uh, can uh, be considered a soot-free, and this is the full Euro 6. We're not talking about any kind of a modified Euro 6 
option. But in addition, the US or North American standards equivalent to EPA 2010, which also require uh, technology like the diesel particulate filter on diesel engines. And so we start by taking this sort of performance-based approach uh, to, to our definition of soot-free, and it's a fuel-neutral definition as well. But uh, those aren't the only ways we can see soot-free engines deployed. I think just to kind of focus on specific engine types here, really any diesel engine that has a filter on it uh, where the, the, the cleanest, lowest sulfur fuel is available uh, is, is soot-free. Uh, but in addition to that, any gas engine, uh, since gas is a much cleaner burning uh, fuel, uh, in addition to any zero emission electric drive engine, uh, and we, we've seen and, and are continue to see increased interest in zero emission electric drive, not just because of its air quality benefits, but also because of its climate benefits. So these are the ways in which we're defining soot free. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the vast majority of buses sold today are diesel powered. Um, taking into account the definition of soot free and based on numbers we have from 2014, we find that really only about 20% or one fifth of all new buses sold today can be considered soot free. Now there, there's a number of regions through which we don't have data, but those are regions that, that either don't have vehicle emission standards or where we know the emission standards are not equal to Euro 6. So, so basically, we're comfortable saying that about 20% are, are soot free and the rest are not. Uh, there are regions, uh, including India and China, um, uh, as well as others that are, are either in the process of adopting or have already adopted standards that will require soot free emissions from the entire fleet. Uh, as soon as 2020. Um, there are buses obviously in places like India that are already soot free because they're using gas. Uh, and, and the same is true in other parts of the world. Uh, so, so we have a challenge here if we are to really see uh, the accelerated deployment of soot free engines. And uh, again, insofar as there are deployments of uh, bus rapid transit systems, either new projects or expansions, we see those as really important opportunities to invest in the kinds of infrastructure and the vehicles that establish the entry point for the broader uptake of soot-free engines uh, within those cities and within those countries as a whole. Uh, let me just move on to talk about the soot-free buses project and the activities uh, and get into some of the research uh, we in this project and have been focusing ourselves over the last two years on 20, 20 specific megacities that were identified because of their size, their air pollution level, their geographic location, and the fact that they, at the time of the start of this project, were all in countries that did not require national soot-free emissions performance. Uh, over the last two years, we have seen progress in, 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 in a couple of cities, Santiago, Mexico City, Istanbul, specifically where either through voluntary actions or national or local requirements, all new buses will meet soot-free emissions performance. Uh, so we're pleased to see that engagement sort of on the policy side. But in many other cities where we have visited uh, or where we have had uh, conversations and, and even seen some policy development, uh, there, is, there is real, I think, effort underway uh, to, to, to make a shift. And, and a number of these cities have bus rapid transit systems already in them. Uh, and so we see opportunities clearly in these cities uh, to dig deeper into sort of the status of the BR, those BRT systems and the opportunity to transition to soot-free engines. Um, while our main focus of our project was to go to these cities and to secure commitments to shift to soot-free uh, bus procurement, um, it isn't enough, we realized, to just focus on the demand side, which is to say the city sending a public signal that they want soot-free buses and will buy only soot-free buses. We needed as well to focus on the supply side, and that meant working with the manufacturers directly. 
So in Paris, uh, just uh, just about a few weeks ago, really, uh, in late September, we launched what we call the Global Industry Partnership on Soot-Free Clean Bus Fleets. We, uh, the ICT, along with the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and, and our project partners, UN Environment, C40 Cities, and Central Mario Molina Chile, joined with four bus and engine manufacturers who have global, a global, global market presence. Those were Scania, Volvo Buses, Cummins, and BYD, all of whom manufacture uh, soot-free bus technology around the world uh, and sell it uh, around the world. Uh, we asked them to make some specific commitments, and you can find even the signed uh, commitment statements from each manufacturer on the CCAC website. The first commitment was to, to make their soot-free engine technology available in all of the 20 targeted cities I mentioned. Uh, that technology is available no later than 2018, where the fuel is available to support them. And I think this is probably most relevant to diesels, um, but uh, it also is relevant to the question of gas and electric as well. Cities that don't have that fuel have to first make it available and take that first action in order to gain access to the soot-free technology they, these manufacturers are providing, but they have committed to make it available in those 20 cities and potentially to others as well. They have committed to, to provide product specifications uh, regarding their products to uh, to the cities and to identify a point of contact for further follow-up, including uh, activities like demonstration and procurement. Uh, so they're really uh, working with us to break down the barriers uh, to gain access and knowledge about the technologies they provide. Furthermore, they've, they've volunteered to provide uh, public reporting on the number of soot-free buses and engines they sell and to update all of the information on product specification contact and uh, public reporting on an annual basis. So this is, I think, a really important signal from the manufacturers and something that those that cities specifically should take advantage of, and especially those uh, of you who are working in any of the 20 targeted cities. And for those of you who may be working outside of the 20 targeted cities, I think there's certainly opportunity for follow-up with the manufacturers to understand what more what more they could make available, which is to say what other cities they could be targeting. Um, we also wanted to uh, broach the question of finance. How do we pay for these buses? Uh, and I think that's another really important question that uh, many of you uh, are dealing with and, and are curious about, since we want to know, are these more expensive? If they're more expensive, how much more expensive, et cetera. Uh, so let me just sort of introduce uh, a few things here, uh, beginning with this idea of total cost of ownership. Uh, as you know, when you buy a bus, it's not a one-time a transaction. There's a tra there's a basically a cost to owning that bus over its full useful life. This is an example taken from Real Data in Sao Paulo. Uh, we have that purchase cost in the first year of operation, but throughout the life of the vehicle, we have many other operational costs as well, the most significant of which is fuel. And in fact, when we add up all of the costs over the life of this vehicle, we find that it's the fuel price that is the most important uh, purchase element. Uh, so if one is looking to buy new buses and not paying attention to the the, the, the energy performance or the fuel fuel savings of the new technology, then it's 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 being just ignorant of the of the total cost and investment that's required in that technology. And so to just sort of add to that point, uh, I I think it often is the case that we pay maybe too much attention to the purchase price and not enough attention to the total cost of owning a bus. Uh, what we wanted to do was was understand how the total cost of ownership perspective changes our perspective on new technology cost. Uh, this is uh, an example of some data that we generated again for Sao Paulo. On the left-hand panel, you have uh, a couple of different uh, bus technologies beginning with Euro 4 as sort of the base comparison technology, Euro 4 diesel compared against to what we consider to be soot free. So Euro 6 diesel, Euro 6 hybrid, Euro 6 gas and battery electric. 
And as you can see, if we're just focusing on the upfront purchase price, then yes, these cleaner technologies uh, are basically adding equipment and other uh, sort of more advanced um, uh, elements to the vehicle itself. And that does have a higher cost. But if we looked at the total cost of ownership, in fact, it's the mirror image that the Euro 4 diesel is the most expensive to, to own over its lifetime compared with a Euro 6 diesel, for example, that may have uh, better fuel efficiency because it's a kind of newer, newer generation technology. It's including more, more, um, more advanced uh, controls. Euro 6 hybrid, which obviously has things like regenerative braking uh, and, and others, including battery electric. And so I think it is, it is a mistake to only focus on the incremental upfront purchase price of the bus and not on the total cost of ownership of the vehicle. We took this kind of approach in looking at, well, what is the total cost of shifting the 20 cities to soot-free technologies? So in this matrix, uh, we illustrate what we understand to be the current baseline technology in each of those 20 targeted cities I mentioned earlier, and what the availability is of soot-free technology in, in those cities uh, based on the current fuel that we know is there. Uh, in almost all cities, there were more than one soot-free technology already available. Battery electric was something that we consider to be available everywhere because every city has electricity. Uh, so, uh, so we ran the numbers uh, and we came up with the following conclusions. Uh, number one, that if all of those 20 cities were to shift to the least cost soot-free technology, so not picking any single technology, but just focusing on what we thought would be the least cost soot-free in each of those cities, that in fact, there would be 14 billion in total and lower net outlays from the purchase of, that, of those cleaner, more efficient uh, buses. So that's to say, there is no incremental cost based on these numbers. There's this incremental savings. Uh, and if we were to add to that the monetized value of the avoided pollutants, black carbon and CO2, that actually the savings are triple. Uh, so, so I think it, there, I think there's sort of a mistaken perspective that cleaner technology means higher cost. Uh, I really hope that this study, which you can find on our website now, uh, starts to to defeat that idea and illustrate how important total cost of ownership is. Now, to be clear, in 17 out of the 20 cities, there were lower net outlays, so lower cost of, op of, of operations. In three of those, there, there was a marginally higher, and when I say marginally, I mean somewhere in the range of two to 3% if we assumed low diesel fuel prices. One of the main reasons why there were marginally higher costs was because, again, going back to fuel, and many in, in those cities, diesel fuel is simply so cheap uh, that it, uh, it it's difficult for the more efficient technologies that use less diesel fuel to compete against that. And basically, it's allowing sort of dedicated older technology diesel engines to continue to use uh, diesel fuel. And so, as high, as diesel fuel prices get higher. Uh, the 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 advantages that come with shifting to cleaner, more efficient, soot-free buses are greater. Um, and so, so again, looking at this at, at as a total cost of ownership perspective is is the key here. We're not uh, that that's the only way we can get these numbers uh, is by looking at it from that perspective. We made a few recommendations uh, for local governments, for example. Uh, to take advantage of this, we think and advise them to adopt minimum soot-free emission requirements in public procurement of buses. And I think this is something that any BRT system can simply do on its own. Um, obviously, where the fuel is available and when it's not available, there have to be investments made in that uh, infrastructure. Uh, there must be, if it's, if it's simply not feasible to set, set some kind of a minimum standard like that, uh, it's certainly feasible to request a soot-free option in any bid, uh, just for comparison, and and to to do even more to actually request a total cost of ownership uh, analysis uh, in in those bids. So um, manufacturers know how to do these calculations. Uh, they 
I think it's in it's in the interest of operators to make them compete on the total cost of ownership and not just on upfront purchase price. Um, since finance institutions obviously heavily involved in investing in BRT systems, um, one thing they can do is favor minimum soot-free emissions in the projects they're financing, favor total cost of ownership, uh, and and where they have funds available but but projects kind of waiting in the wings uh, one thing they can do is just to inform those potential applicants uh, about how they can access that finance to support soot free deployments um, in in all of this which has a very local focus i wanted to just emphasize the national uh the national potential that comes from emission standards and, and other actions since scaling up uh scaling up at the national level through euro 6 emission standards and, and ultra low sulfur diesel fuel is one way to make soot free technology of a more affordable to everyone and and basically the baseline technology so that sort of these city by city efforts don't have to have to happen um but but uh adding to that actions like fuel consumption standards, CO2 emission standards, so that total cost of ownership is lower, and investing in things like low carbon fuel and infrastructure uh, allows for the greatest climate benefits. Um, I wanted to just end on uh, this topic of, of zero emission bus, because I know for many uh, who are looking at, at, at any kind of bus system, and perhaps bus rapid transit as well, that that, that, that many think, okay, why don't we just move directly to zero emission buses? Uh, and, and some of our own work has shown that yes, zero emission buses uh, in the form of a dedicated electric drive uh, have some pretty, pretty significant benefits when you compare against the alternative technologies. In this instance, gas, diesel, and diesel hybrid. The energy consumption of battery electrics across the range of drive cycles is simply, is simply much, much better um, and, and that's one of the key advantages, not just the fact that they're producing zero pollution, but they're producing very, very low levels of carbon dioxide. Um, but because these are electric buses, we obviously have to think about, well, what's the carbon that's emitted from the generation of the electricity? And one of the things that I worry the most about is battery electric buses that are being powered by diesel generators, especially in places that have uh diesel generators as kind of a fill-in power supply where the uh where the electric grid is not very reliable um so what we wanted to do was just take a take a look at what it would mean for the uh cities the 20 targeted cities that that i mentioned earlier to actually uh shift to soot free technologies and what would be the the least carbon intensive option among the range including zero emission dedicated electric but also the gas and and diesel uh and one of the inputs was just this understanding of what is the carbon intensity of the electric grid is it possible that in any of these cities the zero emission electric drive is actually worse for climate than the the alternatives uh um, and and this is an example of the kind of data we used and, and did find that in places like South Africa, something like 90% or greater of the electric grid is powered by coal. So that that's one that was that was one part of the world where we were thinking, well, maybe uh, maybe uh, zero emission electric isn't uh, the solution. Um, so the results are, are here illustrated in in this next slide. Um, the way to read this slide is. Uh, anything in yellow is zero emission, and, and the numbers indicate the, the GHG life cycle emissions in each of the 20 cities. Interspersed in, in that is uh, the, the sort of the alternatives, uh, whether they be fossil diesel or CNG or biofuels, either uh, liquid biofuels or gas biofuels. And, and all of these cities are ranked. So at the very bottom, you have a city like Addis, uh, where basically it's all hydroelectric and so having a zero emission dedicated electric bus there would would deliver buses that have the best environmental performance of any other city that we're working in. Um, at the very top you have uh, biodiesel palm oil which is to say if any of these cities were using biodiesel palm oil in their bus rapid transit fleets 
that those buses would be, be the worst environmental performers, even worse than a fossil diesel Euro 6. So, so that's how you, so, so then going down the list, you're able to see sort of where for any particular city, what is a better technology and what is a worse technology. Uh, and, uh, and, and in essence, what we found was that for bus rapid transit systems operating at what we refer to as medium speed urban driving conditions, that we didn't find any city where a, di a fossil diesel or a fossil gas engine made sense. Uh, we did see cities where a, a biodiesel using 100% animal fats, for example, made a lot of sense. Uh, or biogas engine using landfill digester gas made, made sense in, in, in a number of cities. And so that's the way to think about how, what, what, what the further opportunities are for combustion engines, uh, whether they be diesel or gas, that, that they have to basically move away from uh, fossils, fossil sources, if they are to be in any way competitive with zero emission electric drive. Uh, but in the vast uh, majority of cities, uh, dedicated electric drive is 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 the is is a very good zero emission, uh, low carbon solution that I think deserves consideration. So I'm going to wrap up here and just uh, conclude with uh, my last slide, giving some links. Um, I I I believe we'll be making these slides available. Um, to you all, uh, including a recording of the webinar. Uh, and so if you aren't able to jot this down right now, uh, uh, don't worry, you will have access to the slides and can find uh, all the reports that I've just discussed available on our website. Um, and so with that, I'd like to end my presentation uh, and thank you all very much. And I will now hand it over to Sarah and I believe we have some time left to take some questions. So I'll stop there, Sarah. Thanks, Ray. Uh, yeah, we can go ahead and open up the floor for questions. Um, so if you have a question, go ahead and use the raise your hand tool and we'll go ahead and unmute you. And just while we're waiting, the industry partnership that I mentioned, um, uh, we, we obviously don't see that as uh, kind of like a, a, a one-off thing that, uh, in fact, at this moment, we're working with those four industry partners that I mentioned to explore what, what I'm referring to as a working agenda. And so the idea there is to carry forward a discussion, an ongoing discussion with them about um, things like uh, procurement best practices for buses, uh, demonstrations and pilots in cities, um, uh, uh, things like financing of buses. You know, many of these industry partners have their own financing arm, and so they are already in a position to do direct financing themselves, independent of any other financing sources that, that may be available in cities. Um, and, uh, and a number of other topics, fuel quality, um, et cetera. So I just wanted to uh, mention that for those of you who may be interested in this industry partnership and what it means, uh, hopefully the information that they're making available is useful to the cities, to operators. Uh, we would like to see more partners join uh, and I expect that there will be. Um, so we think that's, that's an important step uh, and certainly wanna ensure that there is private sector engagement in this topic. It looks like we have one one question, so I'll go ahead and unmute Adriana. Hi, um, this is Adriana from uh, Stockholm Environment Institute, and my question is, uh, perhaps it wasn't mentioned explicit, explicitly, but how does inspection and maintenance figure into this program? Because no matter how clean the fuel is and the technology of the buses, if there's not a proper inspection and maintenance program in any of these cities, such as Nairobi or Addis, then the clean uh, technology of the vehicle, such as diesel particulate filters, immediately clog. So um, is that figured in your program? Right, so just a few thoughts about inspection and maintenance. So first to focus on the maintenance side, right? With any bus, there is a standard maintenance uh, procedure, uh, whatever the technology is. And 
uh, one of the one of the biggest obstacles to clean transport sort of writ large is is maintenance the failure to properly maintain the vehicle um, which which in many instances is due to the lack of resources but also due to the lack of training um, when we're talking about these soot-free technologies and, and and some of them require more maintenance than others I would say that probably the the gas engine uh, at least the emission control systems require, I think, perhaps zero maintenance, whereas with the diesel uh, Euro 6, that there is filter, um, there is filter cleaning, for example, if the onboard diagnostic uh, sensor lights up, that, that indicates a need for inspection. Um, so uh, I guess the, the first point is that any there is the expectation that any fleet operator has is undertaking um, um, a maintenance, standard maintenance practices. And if they're not, then they run the risk of uh, either voiding the warranty on the vehicle or um, or simply not being given a warranty by the manufacturer. Um, the the so so there are the risks that the operator him or herself is running. Um, so what's the role of, of public policy here in, in, in inspection and maintenance? I guess so, so that's the second question. Um, uh, there obviously are, uh, there is there is in any kind of clean transport uh, program in a city a need for inspection and maintenance programs, effective inspection and maintenance programs. Um, one of the things that makes this the, the technology I discussed, soot-free technology, Euro 6 equivalent technology, uh, uh, I think so much more favorable to inspection and maintenance is is the is the existence of um, uh, first durability uh, guarantees with that uh, with any kind of a, a Euro 6 engine the manufacturer must demonstrate real world emissions technology performance for seven years or up to 700,000 kilometers uh, so the the technology is is intended to be durable uh, uh, and and in fact require uh, less maintenance as a way to avoid or as a way to actually extend the lifetime of that technology so so I guess the strategy there is really a technology strategy how to avoid the need for in, for 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 maintenance intervention from the the human actor to keep the the quality of those emissions going. Um, uh, and 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 when it comes to bus rapid transit fleet specifically, um, I guess the 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 policy question there is really one about resources, ensuring that there is sufficient resources made available to the operator uh, to invest in the people, the tools, uh, and the the training uh, that's needed to support that. Um, um, in those places where it's it, it it simply seems impossible, right? Because in many cities it seems impossible to get any proper maintenance going. There is always the option to do what's called a service uh, contract with manufacturers. So that is that is in fact what was done in in Trans Jakarta in 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 in, in the city of Jakarta with the Euro Six. Um, the 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 manufacturer Scania in that instance offered uh, a servicing contract. So they sold the buses and then they said, if you pay this this extra amount, uh, we'll basically be the ones to do all of the maintenance for you. Uh, we'll be the ones to make sure the fuel quality is the right fuel quality. We'll find all the replacement parts where they are where they are needed. And so I think that can be an attractive solution in those places where. We know uh, they're just very high hurdles, if you will, to getting effective uh, maintenance done on the vehicles. And that can that can also be, I think, a valuable initial investment to develop local training as well, to ensure that the people that Scania is using are, are local people uh, who are going through a Scania training program in that instance. So um, so I agree that 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 there, there are these important, I think, in questions and concerns about proper inspection and maintenance, but that's true for any vehicle, whether it be soot-free or not. And I think that it's, it's really a question of resources and finding the right tools and strategies to ensure we're getting effective inspection and maintenance. And then utilizing, I think, the advantages that come from the, 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 
the newer technology where there's there's simply less maintenance required uh, as that solution. Okay, um, Sarah, any any others? Uh, yes, we have one question uh, submitted in chat. Um, did the financing study look at the cost of adding a charging infrastructure to the total cost of ownership calculation? Yes, the answer is yes. Uh, speaking about charging infrastructure, where we were looking at uh, the dedicated electric drive. So the total cost of ownership for dedicated electric drive does include charging infrastructure. Um, uh, we did not assume infrastructure investment uh, for diesel or gas. And the reason for that is we were tailoring least cost switch free technology in the cities to the infrastructure that we know is already available in those cities. So uh, we basically were, were assuming that uh, in any of those cities where we were looking at diesel or gas, we were using the existing uh, infrastructure. Um, so long as the fuel was available. So again, so actually that led to a lot more uh, uh, applications of gas than diesel, at least in those places where uh, we didn't see the ultra low sulfur diesel fuel. Um, so even with the charging infrastructure included there, I think the battery electrics, uh, which were the, 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 the sort of the electric drive technology we focused on in addition to hybrids, um, but the battery electrics still looked pretty good. All right, we have uh, one other? additional question. For the presentation, my name is Cecile. I work for the World LPG Association. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned this initiative, uh, the Global Industry Partnership on Soot Free Clean Buses, because I believe that procurement is a key issue that public procurers face when they want to purchase. Um, alternative fueled uh, vehicles. I'm not talking about diesel here, but more um, gas and uh, electric um, gas, yeah, CNG and, and also uh, LPG or, or propane, as uh, you didn't mention it, but it's also suit free. I was wondering if as part of your project, you also uh, can facilitate the pooling of um, resources from cities, for example, to make sure that um, they find suitable um, alternative fueled uh, buses um, um, and they find manufacturers that are willing to, uh, to, to sell them uh, to them at a reasonable price. Because what I hear is sometimes it's hard for those cities to find uh, 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 manufacturers to respond to those, uh, to those uh, procurement uh, calls. Good. I think an excellent point. Um, I've had manufacturers uh, tell me we'll sell any city soot-free technology if they can order a thousand buses at a time. <laughs> um, when we go to places like Mexico City where Metrobus, the BRT operator, is buying something like 30 to 80 buses a year, obviously there's a scale issue uh, and I think, uh, I think your point is well taken. Um, we have looked at models for uh, uh, for uh, joint procurement. Uh, there's uh, an example of that done in um, in Europe around fuel cell buses uh, that seems to be going fairly well. Uh, that's getting manufacturers to invest in scaling up their production of those. Uh, we've also been aware of. Um, uh, a different kind of a different approach, which is having, for example, a national entity, uh, maybe Ministry of Transport, Ministry of Environment, buying uh, buying some large number of buses and then basically distributing those or allocating those to cities. Uh, so that's another approach that can be taken. Uh, there's a third approach. Uh, so one thing that cities themselves can do on their own uh, is to um, is is to uh, basically ex uh, think about their procurement over the long term. So I think often cities uh, wait until they have the money and then they buy buses in a given year. And then they wait for the next tranche of money and they buy buses in another given year. 
and that it's it's sort of a very halting effort in this way. Um, that if a city can, or a BRT system or an operator, whoever it might be, can do a bit more long range planning and signaling about their technology direction, that that I think can facilitate conversations with manufacturers to say, look, it, can you give us this technology over the next X number of years, if it, maybe it could be five years, 10 years, because over those longer time periods, you're obviously, you're obviously assuming the purchase of many more buses. Uh, and so uh, I think it is possible, and this is something we'd also like to take to the manufacturers. I think it is possible to have those kinds of conversations and say, can you give us a certain price per bus if we commit to a certain uh, bus technology uh, or even bus model uh, over a certain number of years? Um, or at least have the option, right? And so it, in, in the case of the option, uh, if, a, if a city or an operator decides, yeah, we committed a few years ago to have this same technology, but we want something different, well, then they lose the option. But I think it is feasible in, at the start to, to sort of request the, uh, request the option, somehow negotiate that price, uh, and, and this is important for the manufacturers who then can do their own long range planning, which is necessary for them to scale up production and to offer, I think, a competitive price. Um, the, the, the last idea is how, is, to, is, is how to kind of link up cities in a way. So to link up cities within a given region um, uh, around a single procurement. Uh, and, and, and I think that uh, I, I'm surprised that this doesn't happen more um, we are, uh, as I mentioned, working in this project with C40 Cities, which has uh, its, its, its 80 plus or more cities now around the world. Uh, they also have their, their C40 Finance facility, which is a, it's a, basically a funding mechanism for financing um, cleaner technology buses. And, um, and that's something that we would like to explore further to see how bringing together cities and manufacturers could lead to maybe a standardized bus model being available, standardized, more standardized uh, bus engines or bus technologies being available as say a base option. And then perhaps cities could, if they, if they really insist on it, could deviate from that and incur a higher cost. But, uh, but but I would I would like to see us go in that direction where we're working with the manufacturers where they're providing some kind of low cost base model that's sort of a default option anywhere uh, and then um, and then going from there and seeing uh, whether we couldn't uh, facilitate some kind of joint procurement in that way so I think a good point and something that we I, I expect we'll be looking at uh, further. Thanks, Ray. Uh, we have another question that was submitted. What has been the strategy towards the regular non-BRT buses in, the, in these cities? I, another great point, right? And so uh, the phrase non-BRT buses um, uh, can refer either to, uh, let's just say, you know, uh, feeder buses, or it can refer to the privately owned and operated um, service, uh, maybe even the informal sector of bus service. Uh, our project has tended not to uh, focus too directly with those actors because honestly it's a more challenging kind of environment. Uh, one of our primary theories of change in this work is to focus on captive fleets that are publicly regulated or publicly operated. And the reason for that is the public entities are the ones also involved in policy decisions and choices. And so, and also have access to, I think, greater levels of resources, including, you know, international or, or national loans, et cetera. Um, banks are also just more willing to, to, to finance or fund a public entity than they are some of these private actors. Um, so, so there was simply kind of a feasibility question there. Um, but we also weren't necessarily looking for scale uh, at the start of this project. We were looking for entry points. And so if, 
as I as I focused on all those 20 cities, our goal is to see a transition in all the bus fleet buses operating in that city, and for that matter, all the all the vehicles in that city. But in many of these cities, there simply is no starting point, and so we wanted to just identify at the minimum one fleet. Uh, preferably a publicly operated or regulated fleet in each of those cities that can make the shift. Uh, this is where I think BRT can be so attractive because in, in many cities, and I'm thinking here specifically about many cities in Africa, but also in Latin America, uh, the BRT system does get public finance uh, or does have international kind of advice and support. Uh, it is formalized. Um, it tends to prefer newer bus technologies already. It is uh, kind of a locus for infrastructure investment already. So to me, BRT systems are a really attractive entry point in places where you simply have, uh, you know, low quality fuel, low quality bus service already, uh, little national engagement, maybe even the absence entirely of emission standards at the national level. Uh, so if we can capture the opportunities, I think, presented by these BRT systems and sort of even go system by system and think, what is the next procurement decision? Uh, then I think that informs the conversation about how we start bringing in the cleaner soot-free technologies into the fleet. And if we can, if we, I think, can make progress with those entry points, then that becomes the foundation for broader change that then can bleed into, if you will, or expand into uh, the, the informal sector, the feeder buses, et cetera. But we have to start somewhere. And that's why I think it's so valuable to think about uh, BRT systems as these entry points. Um, uh, so we do want to eventually get to all the buses, but um, in our project, we did try to focus on one fleet, uh, preferably the largest fleet, but again, a publicly operated or publicly financed fleet uh, where we could engage directly with the local government. All right, uh, Sarah, it looks like that may be the last question. Is that right? Yep, that's the last question I'm seeing. Okay, great. Um, why don't I just uh, say thank you Thank you to everyone, and it's been a pleasure sharing this work with you. Uh, Sarah, can you give any details on the availability of the recording or the slides, if you know any of those at this point? Uh, yes, I'll add the slides to the page um, after I get off the webinar, and then I hope to have the recording up on the event page by the end of the week. So the slides uh, will be on the event page, is that right? Correct. Okay, great. Um, all of you are able to see my email address there. If you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to, to send me an email to that address. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much for attending. And thank you, Sarah.